I have the privilege of being able to bring the message to you guys this morning. And it's about parenting. So we're in a series called It's Not You, It's Me, and it's all about relationships. Uh, last week we talked about um, dating, um, and the, the, the main idea was this. Uh, well, actually, I'm getting ahead of myself. Please, please excuse me. <laughs> uh, we're, we all get to that in a minute. Uh, but we are in week two of our series, It's Not You, It's Me. And I want to let you guys know that if you'd like to follow along, we've created a way for you to do that. So when you first walked in, you probably got a folded piece of paper. We call that the bulletin. And inside the bulletin, there are flyers with upcoming events. And we also have the message notes in there. And we have pens available. So if you'd like to take notes, you can just pull that out. There are fill in the blanks. You can fill in those blanks to follow along. Also on version, if you have the version Bible app, uh, you can pull that up in any app store, and you can find the events tab in the app, and you can find Lifeline Church and follow along. That's how I like to take notes digitally, so I pull it up and save it and follow along. Um, and I want to let you know that whether you're here watching online, good morning, Facebook, uh, or if you're in the house, absolutely we believe every week that God has a message of hope, love, and encouragement that he wants to speak directly to your heart. And so... Uh, we, we absolutely believe that. We're so glad you're here this morning. So from all of us, whether you're visiting because, you know, you're here to support a friend or a family member or you were dragged here by somebody, doesn't matter how you got here, we're glad you're here and we hope that you feel loved and accepted. Amen? All right. So uh, week two of our series and the, the main idea, this is your first blank. So if, you, if you're taking notes, your first blank, it's been the same every week. And that is that all of your relationships have one thing in common. Can you guess what it is? You. You are the one thing that all of your relationships have in common. And so the idea of the series is this. If you focus on improving you, everybody wins. And Jesus said it like this in Matthew chapter 7. He says, why worry about a speck in your friend's eye when you have a log in your own? <laughs> How can you think of saying to your friend, let me help you get that speck out of your eye when you can't see past the log in your own eye? Hypocrite! He says, first get rid of the log in your own eye, and then you will see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. And so basically the Bible is saying this, stop trying to fix everybody else. <laughs> stop calling so much attention to what everybody else is doing wrong. Your job, your relationships, your better life is really an inside job. It's an inside job. So last week, we talked about dating and being single. Uh, and this was the main takeaway, to be complete in your singleness. It's a mouthful. Are you ready for it? If you weren't here, this is what it was. To be the person, the person you are looking for is looking for. So if you missed that, you can go back. You can watch it on Facebook. You can watch it on YouTube. You can find that message. Next week, we're going to be talking about healthy conflict resolution. Isn't that sound exciting? I think so. I think so. We're going to talk about navigating the conflict, especially in the workplace, but also as relates to family and friends. I, if you feel like you've never had conflict, you're wrong, okay? <laughs> and conflict resolution, we should be really good at that. There's, there's a way to be great at that, so don't miss next week. Uh, but today we're going to talk about parenting. How exciting. And we didn't plan four dedications on the same day. That's just amazing. I, I, God, is, God is great. Uh, so I've got a twisted sense of humor, and I would like for just a moment, if I could, to equate parenting to raising dogs. <laughs> so I've got a, I've got a few quotes from, from Cesar Milan. You guys who know Cesar Milan, the dog whisperer? You can find him on Netflix. Okay, speaking of dogs, this is what he says. He says, there is no such thing as a problem breed. However, there is no shortage of problem owners. <laughs> I, that's, I think that's true in parenting. There's probably no such thing as a, a problem child, really. <laughs> but we do have problem parents. We could be, I could, okay. Ah, oh, here's another one. I've never met a dog I couldn't help. However, I have met humans who are unwilling to change. I also think the same is true in parenting. There is probably not a child who can't be helped, but there are parents who are unwilling to change. <laughs> okay, and then this one, speaking of himself, he says, people say I train dogs, but in many ways, I train people. So around six years ago, before Elliot and I had Emma, we had a super lovable, high-energy dog named Lucy. We loved her. Every, you, if you know Lucy, she was super lovable. Okay, um, and Elliot and I watched every dog whisperer show that was available to us on Netflix because we were not sure what to do with a high energy 
lovable dog. Uh, and Caesar isn't lying. He, he really did spend far more time training people than he ever spent with the dogs. And Ellie and I learned a thing or two about um, dog training or what wasn't working as far as us being able to train Lucy. So I can't speak for Elliot, but namely for myself, I realized <clears throat> that I was unwilling to spend the amount of time necessary to train that dog. I just didn't want to. I tried and then it was like, I'm like, I can do this. I watched the dog whisper and I was you know, super encouraged, and I thought, okay, I have all the tools I need to be able to, to make this dog better. And then, like, a week would go by, and she wasn't getting it, and I'm like, I don't, that's it. That, she'll just stay the way she is. That's fine. Um, so I wasn't really willing to spend the amount of time necessary to reinforce her good behaviors. So I, I really wanted a good dog who didn't bark or jump on people when they walk through the front door, uh, but I just wanted her to be that. I didn't really want to take the, the extended amount of time I needed uh, to teach her how to be a good dog. I wanted a perfect dog, and I didn't. Anybody else want a perfect dog, and you don't want to work for it? Anybody? We, we had it. She was, let me tell you one story about our dog. She was so excitable. Um, there was one person in particular who she just, wow. And whenever he would come over, she would jump on him and bark and just get so excited. And then she'd sit down and she'd wag her tail so hard and then she'd pee. So she was like <laughs> flipping pee everywhere. And it was like, just stop it. Like, it's okay to be excited, but please control yourself. It was hard training that dog. I love her. She's still alive. She lives with Elliot's parents and now she's, she's doing better over there. They have more time. They have more time for her. Okay, 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 okay. Um, anyway, I don't really think the parenting journey is much different than dog raising, at, th at least when it comes to our basic motives, because I'm going to make a huge assumption here, but I think that those of us who are parents all want to have great, upstanding kids who, are, who we are proud of. That's a basic assumption. Uh, but the question is, are we willing to put the effort in to see that result? Uh, remember, this is, it's not you, it's me. So how can, how can we be a better parent? What, what can we do in this relationship? So Lucy, our dog, she wasn't a bad dog. She was absolutely a great dog. She was lovable with lots of energy. She liked to play. She liked to snuggle. But she had some terrible habits. I shared one with you. Uh, she wasn't a bad dog. She just needed to have some of her hyper energy redirected. And I don't think kids are much different. Honestly, uh, parenting requires that the adult invest time and resources in redirecting or directing in the first place the energy that lives within their children. Isn't that right? So there are two things I think you should know as a parent that I like to share with you this morning. You can write this down. Number one, you have a father in heaven. Okay, so remember the title of the series, It's Not You, It's Me. The focus is not going to be on how we can make our kids better. The focus is going to be on how can I become a better parent because I'm the only one in this relationship I can change. So 1 John 3, 1 and 2 says this, what marvelous love the Father has extended to us. Just look at it. We are called children of God. That's who we really are. But that's also why the world doesn't recognize us or take us seriously because it has no idea who he is or what he's up to. But friends, that's exactly who we are, children of God. So you could be here visiting today, and maybe you're here to support a friend or a family member, and you may not call yourself a Christian, and you may not even give God much thought. That's okay. I'm, we're still so glad that you're here today, uh, able to visit, and we hope you feel very welcomed. But I do want to say to you right now that whether or not you believe God is your father, he still considers you his son or his daughter. And he sent his son Jesus as a radical display of affection for you. And then maybe you're here today and you are a Christian and you're okay with God being God, but you're not really okay with God being your father. And that's okay too. Um, this could be due to the relationship you had with your parents. This could be due to the lack of relationship that you had with your parents. So there's a disconnect in being able to even relate to a father figure. Or it could be, you know, completely unrelated and due to some other factors. If you're listening today and you do not know God as your father, that's okay, because our life is a journey, and every day we have opportunities to learn new information and to see the world from a different perspective. Um, so I invite you to at least consider today, if you've never considered that God is your Father, that there are more dimensions to God than you may have experienced up to this point. 
Um, and a great starting point, I would say, if you want to know God more personally than you have, this is a great thing you can do, is to identify someone around you who seems to maybe have a relationship with God in some way. And maybe you admire that person, or you're at least curious about what it is that that God relationship looks like. And then I have some questions you can ask. They're up on the screen. The first one is you can ask somebody, why do you see God as your father? Was there an event that led you to this conclusion? And then let them answer and hear their story and see what they say and see if there's any identifying markers in your life that think, oh, okay, I can see, I can see how they, they came to that conclusion. Another follow-up question you can say is, do you actually talk with God like you would with your dad or a father figure? And then what does that look like? So again, ask somebody that question who seems to have a relationship with God. Let them answer and, and hear what they say. And, and in your own life, can I, is that something I can do? Is that something I do even with my own father or with my own dad? And just see what God would, would do in your life. And then a third follow-up question that you can ask is, if you talk with God, does he talk back? And then how does he respond? What does he sound like? And again, let that person answer because maybe you think, I've never heard from God. God might speak to some people, but there ain't, there ain't no way he's going to speak to me. But if you let someone else tell their story and you think, oh, oh, I've had that happen. I've had a similar experience. And then maybe it's possible that God has been trying to speak to you or communicate to you or try and show love to you and you just weren't experiencing it as God. And so... Uh, I say all that because understanding that we are children first and knowing that we have a father who absolutely loves us and who we can confide in creates a wider space, a wider, more balanced place for our kids to grow. Um, it, what I would say is it takes the pressure off of you having to be God for your kid. Uh, and that's huge because when we walk in life and we think we are the be-all, end-all for our kids, uh, everybody's in for a world of hurt. <laughs> uh, and so when you recognize that, wait, wait, wait a second, I'm not God, there, I, there is a God, and he's also my father who loves me, it creates a more balanced place for you to live and for your kids to grow. So as a parent, you are going to travel through all kinds of terrain, Whew, and the role you play in their life will ebb and flow through each season of your child's life. So your role will ebb and flow as your child grows through every season that your child walks through. And in places along the journey, it is going to be imperative that your child sees you as a fellow learner and not strictly as, your, as a teacher or a boss. So you can write this down. I am a child and a parent. That, I'm going to explain that, but write that down. I am a child and a parent. There's a saying around the church world, if you've been around the church world at all, and it says, the ground is level at the foot of the cross, meaning that at the feet of Jesus, get this, your child and you are both his kids. You're equal in the eyes of God, which levels the playing field. What? <laughs> That's crazy. Um, but, but, I mean, honestly, you are not the ultimate authority in your child's life. God is. He has their plan just like he has your plan. If you didn't know that, God has your plan and he has your kid's plan. And I'm going to tell you that your kids mean more to him than they do to you because he created them. He thought them up. He gave them their personality and their unique way of relating to the world. So when they frustrate you, whoa, uh, God, what did you put in this child? Um, you don't blame you. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Whew. Okay, anyway, he gave them their, their unique personality and their unique way of relating to the world. Yes, you did the deed that made the thing happen. And mom, you carried them around for the nine months, but God designed them. God actually designed them. Andy Stanley is a pastor of a church in Georgia, and I read of a few of the books that he's written. In one of his books, I took a lot of this stuff from a leadership book. Crazy. Um, but he makes a pretty bold statement in this book about leadership. And he says, the best parents play the role of a coach, not the role of a boss. I like to be the boss with my three and four year old because you don't know anything. <laughs> but he says, the best the best parents take the role of a coach and not the role of a boss. So a coach has played the game. Um, a coach has learned a few things along the way, and a coach actually wants the team to win. 
A coach stands with the team. A coach cheers the team on. A good coach corrects what's wrong, but also calls out the potential in a player that they don't see for themselves. And a coach can relate to feelings of success and defeat. So a coach is a coach is more equal than a boss is. Proverbs 3, 1 and 2, or th- sorry, 3, 1 through 12 out of the message says this. Good friend, don't forget all I've taught you. Take to heart my commands. They'll help you live a long, long time, a long life lived full and well. Don't lose your grip on love and loyalty. Tie them around your neck. Carve their initials on your heart. Earn a reputation for living well in God's eyes and the eyes of the people. Trust God from the bottom of your heart. Don't try to figure out everything on your own. Listen for God's voice in everything you do, everywhere you go. He is the one who will keep you on track. Don't assume that you know it all. Run to God. Run from evil. Your body will glow health. Your very bones will vibrate with life. Honor God with everything you own. Give him the best and the first. Your barns will burst. Your wine vats will brim over. But don't, dear friend, resent God's discipline. Don't sulk under his loving correction. It is the child he loves that God corrects. A father's delight is behind all this. So obviously, you may not be a child anymore as far as your age and your place in life are concerned, but there is still a God in heaven who knows more than you do, and he's still teaching you and correcting you along the way. So how do you reveal yourself as both a learner and a teacher? Because you do have to play both. You're not just a child. You're also a child and a parent. And so the question is, how do I be a learner and a teacher at the same time? How do I take the role of a coach instead of the role of a boss? And that sounds like this. These are up on the screens for you. One way you can level the playing field is say, one thing I learned a long time ago is. When you're teaching your child something. Another way you can say that is, I remember one time when I was around your age and dot, dot, dot. What you do is you share the story or you share a story or a circumstance that helped you learn the principle that you're trying to pass on. You become relatable. (laughs) I heard this the other day. You humanize yourself. I'm asking someone to write a bio for me for something I was doing, and she was like, I don't know how to do that. So she Googled it, and it says, humanize the person. And I thought it was funny. But really, it's, it's humanizing yourself because in the eyes of your child, it doesn't really matter how old your child is. You are the, the, the one pillar, the one place of safety and security for your child. And from as long as they can remember their entire life, you have been the person who knows it all. You are the person with all the answers. You are the person who, even if you get things wrong, is it really okay to say that you get things wrong? There's a certain level of honor and respect that is rightfully due a parent, but you as the parent, it's your responsibility to level the playing field and say, I, I, I was once where you are. Um, I, I try and do this as often as possible or as often as seems helpful. Usually this comes into play when my kids seem to be a little bit frustrated or discouraged. Like um, most of the time this relates to my three and four year olds, but sometimes I've done it with the 15 year old. And when I'm um, consistently trying to teach them a lesson and they just they just aren't getting it. You know what I mean? Like, how many times do I have to have this conversation with you? This is not what we do. This is not how we act. And I'm talking to them, and they just seem, have you ever seen your kid just get mad? Like, they just turn. Something happens, and it's almost like you see him break. And you're like, that is not the goal of my parenting, to break my child. Um, but you just do the best you can with what you have, and you don't know what you don't know. Um, and so, but it's in those moments where I say, okay, I was a kid once. I remember when I thought my mom wouldn't hear me or my dad couldn't hear me, and I was like, do I not, you know, I I just remember being a kid. And so I'll sit there with them, I'll kind of get on their level, and I'll say, you know what? I remember one time when my mommy was trying to tell me not to do something, and I I was really mad, and I didn't get it. Um, I think I was teaching them about, like, why I got spanked or something. <laughs> and I was like, I, I didn't, I, I remember I hated it and, I, and it made me cry and it made me sad, but it, it was because my, my parents didn't want me to get hurt. And so they were trying, and I realized I didn't like, I didn't like how that felt. And so I decided to stop doing that. And then I don't know if they got that, but what, they, what both my kids did, they said, You were a kid once? <laughs> 
<laughs> you were a kid once. And then they said, what? So then they started asking me questions like, well, what did your mommy do? Just all kinds of stuff. But it, it's whether or not they get the point, leveling yourself as a learner brings humility to your heart. And humility will always bring honor to those around you. Humility will always elevate those around you. But the proud in heart will be leveled. And so as a parent, make yourself relatable. It'll seem counterintuitive because we want to be the boss and we want to be in charge. I'm the adult around here. It's my job to, to teach you how to be and to fix all your problems. But that's really not true. You're a coach. You're guiding them into something greater than they know right now, and you've got experience. And so share your experience along the way because it will level the playing field. You may be a parent, and you may more, know more than your kids because of your experience, but I hate to break it to you, you aren't an expert at life either. <laughs> Humanizing yourself will absolutely expand your child's perspective and give room for the Lord to move in your child's heart. So here's another thing about coaches. They have one goal and that is to win the game. Every coach wants to win the game. They send their team out to win the game. That's, that's what they do. And every good coach goes into the game with a strategy on how they think they're gonna win the game. But a good coach who really wants to win will scrap the play if he realizes it's not gonna win the game. So this may be something you've never considered before, and I'll tell you that it was only in the last year that I was even like, exposed to this idea, but as a parent or as parents, do you have a goal in mind for your parenting? Um, write this down. What is the purpose behind my parenting? Now, your being a parent could be completely random, meaning this was not your intention, <laughs> um, and that's okay. Uh, you're, it can still be completely random in the fact that when you were little, you wanted to grow up and have a family, but that was the extent of, I want to have a family. There may not have been a purpose behind it, and, and that's okay. I'm going to, I read another book. It says, the, this is what it says, the uncertainty of the landscape will require constant reassessment of your plans. The uncertainty of the landscape will require constant reassessment of your plans. As a parent, do you ever feel like you are constantly reassessing your plans because the landscape in the first year of your child's life, I feel like you should relate to this pretty well. And then as it keeps going, with like every six months or so, I feel like a parent has to reassess the landscape and say, okay, is this still working for my child? Is this still wor working for us? Where are we headed and what are we doing? The landscape is always changing and it feels like you're constantly reassessing. And the, but the, other quote, the other part of the quote says this, clarity of vision will compensate for uncertainty in planning. In other words, if you are clear and confident about the destination, you can handle a few detours along the way. If you are clear and confident about the destination, you can handle a few detours along the way. Let me tell you, parents, you're going to hit some detours that were not on your agenda. <laughs> and you're not going to know how to handle them. You're not going to have been prepared for it. It's going to come to you out of left field, and it'll take all the floor that you are standing on underneath you and suck the life right out of you. That's encouraging. That's so encouraging. Because it's relatable. You, If you've whatever. But if you're confident about the, the destination, you can handle those detours along the way. So clarity of vision or winning the game, they're one and the same. If, you're clear, if you have clear vision, which is to win the game, that translates into a greater willingness to parent on purpose in uncertain environments. So whether it's your toddler screaming at the top of his lungs because he doesn't want to do what you're telling him to do, and you wonder, good Lord, what am I supposed to do today? In that moment, the vision will help you decide what you do today. The same thing with your teenager. You're, you're going through something with your teenager, and it wonders, if, am I doing this right? It feels like maybe <laughs> you're destroying the soul right out of him, sucking the life right out of him because you're, you're telling him no. Like, you can't do that. Sorry, bud. Uh, and whatever, you've been a teenager. The question is, is this strategy winning, winning the game? Is what I am doing today winning the game for tomorrow? Because a good coach will scrap the play if it's not going to win the game. 
And so a clear vision, one that has truly gripped your heart, it has the ability to push you through uncertainty. When you are convinced that something must be, you are willing to take chances to see it happen. And so you will suffer the hard consequences because this is going to win the game. This is going to win the game. And so I'm going to, I'm going to hold my ground or I'm going to scrap the blade. This is, well, when I, when I look at my child, I look at this relationship and I look at where it's headed. That is not what I want my relationship to look like. And so I'm going to scrap the play. I'm going to get a new play. Last year, I read this book. It's called Raising Passionate Jesus Followers. And that's where I encountered this idea of parenting on purpose. This book is great because it's broken down into age groups. So you don't have to read the whole book. Just read the section that applies to you. It's amazing. Uh, It talks about teenagers, toddlers, everything along the way, but they really break down the goal. What is the goal in parenting? And so Phil and Diane authored that book. They raised four kids and now they have many grandchildren, but their goal, I'm going to share with you their goal and their win in parenting was and still is this, to raise people who love God with passion and love others on purpose. That was their one goal. So it didn't matter what detour hit them. Their question is, Am I raising my child to love God with passion and love people on purpose? So it didn't matter what they grew up to be. It didn't matter what their personality or their, their creative you know, side was like. It didn't matter exactly what they did. What mattered to them was, does my child love God with passion and does he love people on purpose? If I see that active in my child, then I'm winning. Parents, you got to have wins along the way. If you don't know how to define the win in your relationship, when it gets hard, you don't know what to look for. It's really helpful to define the win. So with them, they knew they were winning when they saw their kids showing love to others. That's easy. If I see my kids share, I'm winning. You know, you, you got to have a win in your life. Then they knew they were winning when they saw their kids being passionately in love with Jesus, whatever that looked like for them. And so in trying times, they were able to look at the end destination and filter their strategy and their uncertainty of each day through the goal is what we are doing on track with our goal of what we want for these kids, of what we want our parenting to look like. So a goal should be measurable. You should be able to see if what you're doing is actually working. Um, A coach has the play and runs the play, but if the play isn't leading the team to win, he scraps the play. And the same should be true in parenting. I already said that. If what you're doing is not leading your child to win, then you need to scrap the play or redefine the win. Number two, this is the second thing I think you should know, is I, write this down, I am not raising kids, I am raising adults. I'm not raising kids, I'm raising adults. Uh, So if you are a parent, you already have kids, you know that. (laughs) Just like this is in the book, it comes from another book I'm going to tell you about in a minute. But he says, uh, Christmas tree farmers are not raising saplings, they're raising trees. Right? Right? A wheat farmer isn't raising kernels. He has kernels. He's raising wheat. You're not raising kids. You have kids. You are raising adults. And the idea, that idea is expanded on in this book. It's called Scream Free Parenting. And there's a quote from the book. It says, relationships are supposed to be difficult. Yay. Uh, Because they are designed to challenge us toward personal growth. I believe this is especially true when it comes to parenting. Nothing else demands that we grow in patience and support skills as much as being a parent. No other situation requires as much consistency and integrity. Nowhere else do we feel quite as vulnerable and unqualified as when we are faced with the task of helping a needy and dependent child become a self-directed adult. Uh, Be be encouraged today. (laughs) If you've ever experienced any of those thoughts or emotions, you're right on track. If you felt unqualified or uncertain, join the game, okay? Um, So here's the question. If I'm raising an adult and not a kid, then what should my parenting look like? Write this down, and then I'm going to have you say it. I'm going to have you repeat this after me, after you fill in the blanks. I am not responsible for my child and the choices she makes. I am responsible to my child for how I behave regardless of her choices. Everybody ready to say it out loud with me? One, two, three. I am not responsible for my child and the choices she makes. I am responsible to my child for how I behave, regardless of her choices. No, the focus is on you because ultimately, you are the only one you can control. You cannot make another person do anything. I don't care what size they are. You can't. It'll just make you frustrated, and then when you get frustrated, 
Nobody wants that. Nobody wants that. You can only control yourself. And so what does this idea look like in action? Uh, this is taken from the book. Imagine this. There's two scenarios. There's a parent who's at the park with her son. I've been here. Whew, and she, uh, she asked the question, how do I get my boy to calm down and behave now that it's time to leave the park and get in the car? And he's jumping up and down, screaming at the top of his lungs. Okay? And then she remembers that the last time she was in this scenario, she either had to promise him candy when they got home, or she had to threaten to spank him. Okay? And then she chooses one based on her patience level and how the morning went earlier. Okay? Then there's, there's another scenario. Here's the same parent who's at the park with her same son and asks the question, how do I teach my son to manage his own emotions to calm down now that it's time to leave the park and he's jumping up and down and screaming like a wild man? And then she decides to pause because she said, time went off, it's time to go. <laughs> and he didn't want to. Whew. So she decides to, to pause and observe and then gets calmly curious about what might happen if she doesn't react at all. She stands there. She takes a deep breath. She breathes slowly. And she waits to see what happens when she no longer needs her son to calm them both down. Because that's what happens. We want the other... We, hmm, that's ridiculous. We want our little people, doesn't matter what size the little people are, to calm down and listen so that we calm down. No, 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 no. I am responsible for how I behave, regardless of what you look like right now. Hmm. That's easier. Okay, whatever. So one of these parents feels powerless to influence until she uses force. Think grocery store. You know, when you're in the grocery store and your child is throwing a fit because you didn't buy him a candy bar and he's rolling. How many of you guys have ever walked into a store and said, Good Lord, where are that kid's parents? Anybody? You throw in the judgment around? And then you had a kid. And then you're burning up because you were that one. And then, and then here's, here's, here it is, here it is. You still have kids, but you're at the store alone. And the judgment returns. Where is that kid's <laughs> Parenting is rough, man. It is rough. Okay, one of these parents feels powerless to influence until she uses force like threatening or begging or whatever. And the other is beginning to realize the amazing influence of her own calming presence. I got all day, son. I will cancel all, you don't say that to your child, but in your own mind, you come to a place where you calm down and say, my first and ultimate responsibility is to my son and not to whatever else I have going on around me. And so if I'm gonna be late to an appointment because I'm gonna be calm in the presence of my son, then that's what I'm going to do. And that takes courage, parents, because in the world we live in, we will bow down to the demands of other people. We will bow down to the, the demands of the other adults in our circle, but you are your child's only parent, and it is your ultimate responsibility to calm down and live present. And so I say that you probably won't have to miss your appointment, but you decide in your heart, I'm going to calm down, I'm going to remain calm, and I got all day. You need to calm down and get in the car. Uh, the, anyway, this book is amazing. It'll, it'll help you do that. But before you dismiss option two because it seems too hard or like you really don't have time for that, uh, ask yourself this question. Is option one really any easier? Especially as your child gets bigger and you have to up the reward or up the punishment next time. Or you have to get louder and more aggressive. Is that really easier? I don't think so. I don't think so. I think we got to learn to grow up and calm down. <laughs> uh, so parenting scenarios, they can range from screaming toddlers to dreaded news from your teenager. But each and every event, what it does is it really it, it, it demands that you calm down and control your own behavior as the parent. And sometimes it'll produce that level of anxiety in you that says, I don't know if I can handle this. Like you just hit breaking point. I don't know if I can do this. And that's okay. Parents, the anxiety that rises up in you isn't the issue. That's part of the process. You got to deal with that. It's part of the process. What matters is your response and remembering that you are not responsible for their choices. They're going to make their own choices. You are responsible to love them through their choices 
and to teach them how to make good ones. And as a parent, isn't that what you want? Don't you want a child who is self-directed, self-aware, and able to take personal responsibility for their actions? Yes, yes. And so we have to teach them how to do that. So ask yourself, parents, you can write this down. What do I think are my responsibilities to each of my children? What do I think are my responsibilities to each of my children? I'll give you a hint. I am responsible to how my children for how I behave. My children will model what they see in me. We are on the journey with you on this one, absolutely. The other day, I, uh, I was in my kids' room doing something, and they, no, I was in the other room, and I heard them in the hallway, <sighs> and they were going, well, what did they say? Uh, if you won't let me be in front, then I'm not going to play with you. And then the other one said, well, if you won't let me be in front, then I'm not going to play with you. And I was like, good Lord, when did we teach that ultimatums were okay? Like, that's not how you get somebody to play with you. You give them an ultimatum. But when I tell you that probably in my parenting, I've used an ultimatum to get them to do what I wanted them to do. That's not my goal. So I've got to scrap that play. I can't use ultimatums with my kids. I don't like that. That's yucky. Whew. Galatians 6, 9 says, let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Having a child, I don't know if you know this, it doesn't make you mature. <laughs> it doesn't. It doesn't. Uh, but it does invite you into a maturing process. you got to choose to grow up, though. Yeah, yes. Um, becoming a parent doesn't magically make you an amazing person or, or take away all of your issues. In fact, I would say that having a child amplifies every issue you ever had. And it'll force you to deal with it. Goodness, looking at the face of your three-year-old going, God. Okay, this may seem overly simplistic, but it's something I practice regularly. Write this down. Ask God for help. Your kids have been given to you, and they are a gift. Someone else designed them. Psalm 127.3, we heard that earlier. Children are a gift from the Lord. They are a reward for him. I literally ask God for help, and I also surround myself with people who have gone before me and people who are on the journey with me. Recently, my youngest son was not wanting to go into his classroom, and it was really getting on my nerves. <laughs> Don't judge me, parents, because I know you know. Um, I remember he was crying, and he was talking. When Evan gets sad, he talks really loud. So he was talking really loud, and he was saying, but I like you, Mommy. I want to stay with you, Mommy. I sound heartless. Who could be annoyed at such love? <sighs> I love Evan, but on this day, he needed to be in his class. And I honestly, I wasn't sure what to do because we were here and I just wanted to like shake him, you know, but I'm in public. I can't do that. So <laughs> it's funny. Okay. So <laughs> I know. Okay. Um, so I, I, I remember I, he needed to be in his class, and I wasn't sure what to do to help him. So in my head, I slowed down, and I said, God, I don't know how to help him, and I don't want to shake him. <laughs> and God was quick to answer. Immediately, a new thought came to me. Evan doesn't like being taken away from me. And when it's time for me to drop him off, if his teachers hear him crying, then they'll lovingly come up to him, and they try and help him. But that makes him scream louder. And that's what I was trying to avoid. And so the new thought was this. Evan, when you scream really loud, the teachers are trying to help you. And so they come over and they pick you up and, and they try and talk to you. But if you'll just give me a hug and a kiss and stay quiet, the teachers will leave you alone. I said, it's, it's okay to be sad, but you can be sad and not yell. You can still be sad. That's okay. You can like mommy better than you like your teachers and you can stay sad. But if you want your teachers to leave you alone, you got to stay quiet. And it worked. It worked. And it keeps on working. He's still sad almost every time I drop him off in the classroom. But he's learned a new way to act. And I didn't come up with that. God did. I literally said, God, I don't know how to help him. And he was like, Evan doesn't like his teachers. <laughs> so just get him to be quiet. And I was like, okay, genius. So ask God for help. Sometimes he might drop a new idea in your mind. Other times he might highlight a person or bring a new friend into your life. Just recently I was asking the Lord for help in a different situation. Uh, Elliot and I needed some wisdom and guidance, um, and we weren't sure who to ask. It was a unique situation, a unique scenario. And I was asking the Lord for someone, 
I wanted to talk with a person who'd been through something similar so that I could have real wisdom. I could learn from failure. I could learn from success. But I just, I didn't have anybody. I couldn't think of anybody. Um, and a few days later, we were in a group and we were talking to some folks. And one of them said something. And it was just in the middle of the circle. They weren't even talking to me. They were just talking. And it, whatever they said, it was like, oh, yeah. God reminded me, you asked me for help. And that's, that's the man. Go ask that person. They've been through this situation. They'll have advice for you. And so it was like God triggered my memory of my prayer for help and said, ask him. He's been through this. So ask God for help and be in relationship with people who have gone before you and people who are on the journey with you. People who have gone before you, those are people who have kids older than your kids. So you can learn from their failure. You can learn from them, their success. And then you need people on the journey with you who are sharing the daily struggle because... T- Parenting's rough. <laughs> and you need some friends along the way. You need to be able to laugh and cry together. We have life groups here at Lifeline. That's one of the best ways to get in relationship with people. When you go to the back wall and you look at life groups, you're, this season you're not going to find one on parenting. We don't have one this season. But can I tell you that in each and every life group, you will find parents. You'll find people who are either on the journey with you or who have gone before you, and you'll be able to make new connections and relationships and surround yourself with people who you can do this life together. So right now we're just going to go ahead and bow our heads and and close our eyes, and we're going to pray. So I invite you to do that. Go ahead and close your eyes, bow your heads. I'd like to pray with and for you. God, I thank you that you are our Father. Whether or not we've realized that or we've given you permission to be that person to us, Lord, I thank you that you are our Father. You are a Father in heaven who loves us. Lord, and we are not alone as parents or as people, even if we don't have kids. um, You're still our Father and you still love us. You're the Daddy who says, come come climb into my lap or come sit next to me. Come put your head on my shoulder and just tell me about your day. So, Father, I ask right now that if there are people in the room who haven't experienced you as Father, Lord, that you would touch them this morning. They would experience your love and your presence in a new way, a way that they haven't experienced before. Lord, I ask that if their hearts and their minds are being opened to see you in a new light, Father, that they would receive that and you would come in and you would do an amazing work because you love us and because you have plans and a purpose for us. So with every eye closed and every head bowed, if you are in the room today and you don't know God as Father, Maybe you've never given your heart to the Lord, or you have, but he still seems kind of distant. But you want to enter into a new relationship where there's more to this God relationship than I had thought of before. Then I want to pray with you. And it's as simple as all counts to three, you raise your hand up into the air, and then you can put it right back down, and we'll all pray together so no one feels like they're being outed. But if that's you, and you want a relationship with a heavenly father, uh, then I'm just going to count to three. So right now, one two, three. If that's you, go ahead and raise your hand up into the air. It's just signifying that, yes, Lord, I I hear that you're saying to me. I hear you're speaking to me. Amen. Church, if you guys would just go ahead and pray this out loud with me, Father God, I thank you that you are my Father. Help me to see you as my Father. Help me to live this life well. Thank you for your Son, Jesus. I receive his sacrifice. Fill me with your spirit and lead me in the way you would have me go. Amen. Church, can we celebrate just because God is good?